I'll just go ahead and get started then. So we're gonna, uh, today is our Lunch with Larry series. We're gonna be uh, having an interview with Bakul. Thank you so much for coming, uh, Bakul. Uh, well, and I'll just, uh, a little bit about me, I'll just get through the, the other slides first, a little bit about me. This is just the contact information. So we have one more session after this, we'll be talking about low code and how low code can assist in uh, digital health um, productivity. And if you want, there's the scan me card or, you know, a QR, uh, QR code here for you to get anyone else registered for that session if you care to. Of course, all my contact information, LinkedIn, uh, phone number, email is included. And also we have this historical webinar location. One of the things, the questions that came up in the chat window here was where are these previous webinars that we've done? And this is the link to those webinars. So feel free to navigate to those and take a look as you see fit. Uh, so we'll just get right to the meat of it here. Uh, Bakul is, uh, just wanted to give a little background about him. Uh, he's the director of digital health uh, division at CDRH at the FDA and really has been an integral part of developing regulatory po policy for a, a variety of different topics, mobile health, health information technology, cybersecurity, and of course, uh, medical device software, which is gonna be the topic today. Just a fun fact, uh, Bakul coined the term software as a medical device, which has been in prevalent use in the industry. So uh, you can see Bakul is a perfect guest for our session uh, on development of regulated software. So Bakul, welcome and uh, to the program. Uh, and maybe we can kick off the discussion with a few questions. And so the first one is really fundamentally, I think uh, sometimes people think of different things. We wanna sort of understand the scope. Uh, so fundamentally, what is digital health? Maybe you can give us a sense of the FDA's view of the term and, and what's included. Uh, thank you, Larry, for the kind introduction and uh, hi, everybody. Um, so when I think about digital health, it's not it's not a very perfect definition, but I would say it's a convergence of you know health information, connectivity, and and software that sort of brings information and highlights uh, insights into a person's health. I think that's kind of how I think about it, and it's sort of the continuum from you know not necessarily when you're a patient, but sort of even before you're a patient in general conditions. Um, and that's that's how I think about digital health um, in writ large. Now, FDA does not, you know, regulate everything under the sun that's that's healthcare related, but only when it starts becoming closer to, closer to it's either medical device or either it's in the medical device or it's used to make medical devices. So the, the three kinds um, are are in the in the realm of so either software or digital health products that is a medical device or works as a medical device, um, which means it has to be for, you know, diagnosing, curing, treating, mitigating a disease or condition. And two is it's used inside a medical device, so it's like a component of it. And the third is, you know, um, you know used in the manufacturing or in the production of or maintenance of the, the, such a medical device. So those are sort of the three big areas of focus that we've been working on. So maybe you could just discuss a little bit um, why the FDA has become more and more concerned about uh, digital health and, and why there's such a focus. Why is the FDA involved in all this um, this business? So. Well, first of all, the involvement is, is what we have been here all along doing. And it's not about software being something that we regulate today. Uh, regulated today, I think it's been, we've been regulating software for a very long time, and digital health products, so to speak, um, as medical devices, very long time. So it's not something that we are starting to involve. But I think, I think there is this big potential of as consumer technologies enter into healthcare space, you start seeing, um, you're seeing, you're seeing a lot of people trying, trying to get to make products into the space. Um, and I think it's our responsibility to start making clear where things are considered to be medical devices and when they are what is needed, what kind of um, infrastructure that's necessary, what kind of information that's necessary. At the end of the day, you're still making products for patients, um, that, for patients' health. And that's why it's important for us to be uh, not just, you know, making sure that this product is safe, but also being, being clear in terms of what our expectations would be. Sure, so companies like, um... Google and Apple as they're making these devices in the field that are sort of clouding the line. It must be, you know, part of the agency's um, uh, discussion to try to 
clear the line so it's more uh, easy for uh, companies to understand what's on the medical device side versus sort of consumer electronics side. Yeah, and it's, it goes back to our fundamental uh, um, uh, vision uh, for CDRH has been, you know, how do you get good technology to, to patients as fast as we can or, or really giving them access to this good technology? And I think, I don't think we differentiate between who makes good technologies. So I think as long as we can define what that standard looks like, then you, then then people who are willing and able should be able to make that happen. And that's why you start seeing people who perhaps for various kinds of reason, motivations, they want to innovate in the healthcare space can have clear understanding of what what can they do, what they should do, and what's necessary as they as they embark on a, on a journey towards and entering the medical healthcare space or medical device space. Sure. So I, I know the agency has been experimenting with sort of a new regulatory paradigm uh, using innovative methods for uh, providing regulatory oversight and review of digital health applications. So maybe you can mm-hmm. provide some of the progress on these innovative methods. You know, is the, is the FDA close to rolling out any of your recommendations or, you know, kind of where, where are we at from a, a regulatory paradigm perspective? Yeah, so we're not done yet. I don't think we would say we are ready to roll out something and people should start, you know, implementing or actually that's how we would start regulating. I think we're a little bit away from there. Um, we are actually embarking on a really, really novel way of looking at um, so, uh, not novel, but more of a different way of looking at from what we have been look, uh, doing in the past, and and primarily in a couple different ways. Is one, we are, we are approaching this as the entire life cycle of a product from inception to retirement, and you can imagine, um, you know, when when the development happens, and who makes the, who does the development, who does the design, who. Who's actually responsible for making the product, which has also always been important, but and then adding to that that mixture, not only just about the product being safe before it gets to market, but also what does that mean? Um, what does the product actually do in real world? So we're taking a really really holistic approach from a life cycle perspective and saying that I think for a, from a regulatory expectations perspective to assure our safety and effectiveness. Uh, of these products and patients using really good high quality products that are safe and effective, um, we we can look at or we should be looking at everything that that's in the in the life cycle, which means who's making it. So understanding how it's made and who's making it sort of gives us confidence. The product's performance and validation will give it that confidence and how it manages managed risk and unintended consequences would be something that we would we want, we are doing, and we will continue doing. Um, but then, uh, and then at the end, I think not just looking at the rest of the products or understanding what the rest of the products are after it's in the market, but really also looking broader than that and saying, you know, if we had, um, if we had uh, the access or if the companies had access to benefits, um, and it could be from the three-dimensional way of looking at it, saying performance, users, and then health benefits, right? So you, if you start thinking about that perspective, now you have the at any given one point in the life cycle answered by 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 you know certainty or information in at other points in the life cycle, and that's what we are trying to sort of do. Uh, we are very early, um, even though we've been sort of uh, working on this uh, for a while um, for the last two years. Um, we have, we, since it's a really new sort of way of looking at it, we're trying to get to a place where we can understand the company part, we can understand what needs to be in the real world part. So we're not out of the gates yet in terms of establishing a program, but that's something that we're building um, towards. Sure. It seems like uh, the agency is starting to sort of experiment with this continuous oversight versus audit approval. And that other examples are case for quality and maybe the non-product software validation uh, efforts that are going on. Mm-hmm. But, uh, it seems like th- uh, uh, an effort to depend more on company systems than maybe simply on uh, audit approval seems to be the sort of the direction, right. or at least at least sort of venturing out a little bit into this area um, rather than sort of strictly 
depending upon audit approval. Yeah, I think audits are thinking about our audits in a, in a very simplistic way would be, you know, sampling. And I think we, we sample only so much and then with the with with digital health technologies and software, as you can imagine, products iterate and evolve rapidly over time um, and continue to do that, right? So I think a sample taken at one point in time may not be representative over, over long periods. We also, we also are like trying to get as close as possible to, you know, how people operate. Um, and what I mean by that is, you know, as the case for quality and other efforts are going on, we're trying to sort of give credit for people who are already doing good, as opposed to holding to a standard that is, you know, meetable by a lot of people, but has needs, but needs and takes a lot of translation efforts and cost. And we're trying to reduce that translation cost from what people do to what needs to be explained to FDA. And if we can get closer and closer to the actual operations, then we can start recognizing what is good and what's bad. And that's how we're sort of thinking about it. Sure. Well, maybe a couple details. I, in my experience, when we're dealing with companies um, and when we consider development of uh, software as a medical device, in my experience, there seems to be a little bit of a disconnect on uh, how companies view risk management for software as a medical device, maybe separately from uh, software that's embedded in a device. And maybe you could expand on how risk management for software is different than software um, that's embedded in a device, or you know, maybe it's not different, right? Maybe you could, uh, maybe you could just give us some comment on risk management and how that's integrated with the development yeah. process. Totally. I think um, just like people are used to making hardware products and they understand and see risk really easily, right? So hazards can happen, harm can happen by by physical objects and physical things with hardware devices. I think it's really hard to um, imagine for software. So people usually either either would say that, oh, it applies or, or doesn't apply. Or sometimes I've heard people say it applies all the time because you program it once and it can happen happen all the, uh, again and again. So and I don't think any one of the situations are, are the right way to think about it. And this is where risk management, and the good thing about the med tech industry is we do have a standard that people have sort of coalesced around at 14971, which, which gives a good starting point for people to start thinking about how would we think about potential issues that can happen with software. Now you can, now you can imagine when you're software, you're, you always have a computer that you're going to run on. Um, uh, and, and sometimes those computers and the operating systems and the hardware uh, changes over time. And that could be one way of thinking about it as, you know, those are risks that eventually if, you're, if your product, if your software product is, you know, suggesting a diagnosis of some kind or is suggesting um, it's something really, really important, um, there could be a delay, it could be a miss or something else that could happen if, if it didn't capture or it didn't mitigate or it didn't bring that unknown, uh, unknownness about that's not in your control from a platform perspective in, into, into reasonable assurance, right? So that's, so people, people should not be thinking about it, it completely applies and we should do all the things necessary that, that we would do for hardware, but also being able to translate that to software and the associated risk for software because you're you're relying on other things. That would that would be something that I would suggest folks start doing um, as as thinking about risk management itself. Sure. One of one of the things I've found is uh, software in companies is typically seen as almost a different silo. And I one of the questions that I've asked myself is you know, what, does hardware really have any, when we talk about software as a medical device, we're really saying that the software is the medical device. You know, does hardware have any place mm -hmm. in the design controls for software as a medical device? Or how would, how would people view hardware, you know, because the software has to land somewhere. So um, right. any thoughts on how hardware would be included in that discussion? Yeah, I think I think the way um, way I would say we should be, I would encourage people to start thinking about is, you know, if the software has dependencies on other things to have it function, and you need to manage risks of those dependencies. And let's just enumerate a couple, right? So one is a, if you're using it to put it on a mobile platform, if you're designing something for a mobile platform 
or a smartphone, you expect that smartphone to change every year. Now, there's always backward compatibility to some degree, but then after a while, it goes away. How do you manage that? I think that's the risk. Um, and to me, um, you know, if you were to draw analogies into the hardware world, there's there's always things that are that are not all fully made you know, from you know top to bottom in house. For example, screws are never screws and you know bolts and nuts are never made in in uh, like custom design every time in house. That would be inefficient. You're relying on you're relying on some manufacturers. You're relying on suppliers to sort of get there. That and sometimes you don't have supplier controls for those those so-called commodities. So I would think about, you know, there's lots of analogies in our current system that, that allows you to sort of think think through and translate it to the software world. And I think you should just bank upon that because those things apply. Because if you think about even simple things like printer drivers, you don't try, I mean, it's pointless to create a printer driver from scratch uh, when when there's a library that's been tested for many, many, many years or many, many, many times that's actually much more stable than somebody who just designs it from scratch. So there's some benefits and risks that needs to be weighed, but at the same time, when you make those choices, um, you have to manage and understand what, what potential risks are. So you have to do your traditional FMEA, your traditional sort of way of thinking about how, what, what ifs and so on. Yeah, fantastic. So uh, what do you think the biggest barriers are for rolling out your new programs? Any, any sense of what's holding you back? I, so first of all, the program is um, a, a really big undertaking, um, which means that we need to be absolutely we need to be sure if we roll out. So we don't we don't you know we cr we you know crawl before we walk there. And one of the things that we are really uh, concerned about is making sure the program is does not have any unintended consequences. So we're being extremely careful about that. I think it's going to take us. And take us working through those scenarios of um, what and what could what could actually become problematic because we have learned quite a bit over the many years like what is necessary but also we are also looking at where the world is going next and we want to make sure that we are we are building this for the future and not building it for now and I think when you add up all those things. Um, I wouldn't call that barriers, but I would say those are the considerations we have to be really thoughtful and purposeful before we launch a program. Sure. So maybe in lieu of the paradigm, you could help manufacturers understand or provide them with recommendations as how they can engage. What What is it that software developers and, and manufacturers could do to uh, sort of prepare themselves for what's happening in, uh, you know, at the FDA? Yeah, I would, you know, all of our all our programs are based out of good engineering practices, and I know many books have been written on that. But I would say that's sort of the foundation of where we where we where we sort of land. I would say one other thing for folks to start thinking about as you want to engage with this program: keep an eye out on sort of the publications that we are doing. I think we continue to keep this very public and keep it an open dialogue. Uh, but I think if you're if you want to prepare yourself as a as a company, I would say, um, you know, follow follow the best practice you can, and and be ready to explain to an independent person what you do. Um, I think uh, as we start moving more and more towards um, information that is going to let us know how good a company is working on. Uh, or, or making software, I think that 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 part is going to be more important down the road. So just keeping keeping sort of an eye out for that is going to be something that uh, I know every software developer should be doing already, um, and taking into consideration not just about getting a product out, but also making sure it's maintained. And what we mean by maintain is maintaining the safety and effectiveness of that product once it's in the marketplace. Okay, fantastic. I think we'll, we'll probably call it a day. We're past our time here a little bit, uh, but I really appreciate you spending the time with us today to uh, talk through what's going on at the FDA. Uh, look forward to uh, further conversations in the future. So thanks, Bakul. Thank you, Larry, right. and my pleasure. Uh, just so everyone knows, this is our uh, scan for the, the last uh, uh, 
uh, session on the 27th. We'll talk about uh, Mendix and uh, using Mendix in the context of digital health. And just wanted to say thank you everyone for attending and we'll make sure that we get any answers that we missed on the questions. Uh, we'll, we'll follow up with an email afterwards. So thanks again, Bakul. We'll talk soon. Bye-bye.